Hello everybody, welcome back to Reptile Reality. We are back home. For those of you that followed us along on our Thailand adventure, we had a great time. We had some fantastic animal encounters, but it can't go on forever. Have to come home, have obligations, work, and all that sort of thing. So we're back home, back to more of the uh, regular programming. Uh, gonna continue highlighting animals in my collection. Now this week I had something really cool happen here. So I find that it's only appropriate that this week we highlight Pataeus mucosus. So let me go ahead and grab one of those. So this is Pataeus mucosus. The common name it has several common names. One of them is Oriental Rat Snake, I believe. They occur all throughout Southeast Asia, even India. And this one's wild caught. This is a female that's been with me for, oh boy, almost about two years now. And these don't seem to tame down when they're wild caught like this. They are very, very defensive, very fast, agile. Even though this one's been with me for quite some time, it, uh, <laughs> it has no, no trouble giving me a nip. So most colubrids come in in big numbers. They're not very expensive. These were granted a little bit more protection. They're listed in CITES too, which essentially means that <clears throat> they're on a quota system. And in order to uh, import and export these, you need a CITES permit. The reason they were granted the export protection is because of the skin trade, not the pet trade. They, um, they turn these guys into wallets and belts and all that sort of stuff. But they actually are a very, very interesting snake. They are not common. In captivity at all and there's even some morphs and uh, I have some here and I'm going to show you them in just a second so let me get this girl put away so this right here is a hypomelanistic it happens to be a male now in Indonesia they call these sulfurs and the reason I'm wearing gloves is because they they have like a ripping bite and it hurts because they get you over and over and over again. And I'm just not, it's just not my thing. <laughs> so anyway, call me a sissy, call me whatever you like. But it's a beautiful, beautiful snake. It's hypomelanistic and man, I just love this color. I have a couple of them here. This one is more cream color and they actually, the hypomelanistics will range from like a white or off-white bone ivory color and then they will also range to like a yellow color this one's kind of halfway in between now the cool thing about these guys is that they usually will live in the rice farms and they will consume rodents right there on the rice farm so having these guys in captivity usually isn't too big of a deal to get them feeding and established because they will take rodents readily now this is a male and this is about full grown for these guys they may get a little bit bigger. Um, and of course, you know, they're, they're not always going to fall within a certain size range. There are occasionally larger animals than, than this, but this is about, about uh, average here for a full size adult. But really cool. I mean, they're fast and agile and um, you know, a little bit of a handful. They're not for everybody, but I like this stuff. Really smart animals. The, they watch everything that you do. Just super cool. They kind of just fall right into that niche of stuff that I like to work with here. And the hypomelanistics are very rare, especially in captivity. They do come from certain localities, like little micro populations where you'll find a lot of hypomelanistic animals. But as far as, you know, like these guys in the, in the States and that, they're just not here. So... So today is a really exciting day for me. I have eggs that are just starting to pip. Now these are Pataeus mucosas. It's actually a pretty rare snake in captivity. Lucky enough to have some and I bred some. What makes this clutch even more special is the fact that I used a hypomelanistic male bred to a normal female. I have no idea how the genetics work. I suspect that they'll probably be hets, but again, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of the, of the protocol that I use with eggs. Um, of course, 25 years ago when I was doing this, I didn't need glasses. But I'm getting old, so I need glasses. So that's the first step. So these are the eggs. There's 13 eggs. And 
it's actually a little bit different from what I'm used to seeing. All these eggs are pipping together. And this just started today. I just got home from work and popped the lid. I checked this morning, there was nothing. So all these animals are pipping. A couple of the eggs, not yet. And what I like to do is I like to manually pip all the eggs. These are really thick, thick shells. So I like to give them a little bit of help. They're doing fine on their own, but sometimes you need to connect these little, little shreds because they tire out pretty fast and I don't want anybody to suffocate in the egg. That's my protocol. That's what I've done for a lot of years. And that's what's given me a lot of success with a lot of really obscure species. So basically just kind of inspect these eggs. Now I don't pull the babies out like a lot of these retic guys and ball python guys, you know, they just reach in and finger them right out. I give everybody as much chance as possible to absorb the yolk and do all their stuff naturally. But, um, you know, this guy's got, there's his nose right there and he's got it cut open pretty good. So I don't need to do anything to that guy. Now these eggs are all attached. These are some pretty good slits that these guys have made already on their own. So I don't need to, I don't really need to do too much on these guys. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how these little tiny snakes can can pop through these really thick shells. It's pretty pretty amazing feat. And little bubbles there basically indicate that they're breathing. They're blowing bubbles, exhaling through the um, the fluid in there, and it's it's creating bubbles. So these guys are all good. Um, this egg right here. And get this one separated give it a little a little incision these eggs had all adhered to each other by the time i got to them so i couldn't really do much to them so something that i started just on my own because it made sense is i use these curved toenail scissors and the reason i use these uh, as opposed to razor blades and just getting in there and just kind of wildly just cutting holes in eggs what i've always done it doesn't matter what kind of eggs they are um, Clubert eggs, python eggs, whatever. What I like to do is I find a natural crease. Almost always these eggs are going to start to dimple um, 10 to 14 days prior to hatching. So it's real easy. There's a crease right there. There's probably, you know, there's not going to be any kind of animal or anything vital in there. But just in case, what I like to do is cut with the scissors upturned like that. That way there's nothing actually going inside the egg. I'm always really leery about you know, cutting veins and snipping off tail tips and noses and all that kind of thing. So I feel like this is a pretty good way of doing it. And I've never messed up an animal by, by doing this. So obviously, you know, you made a pretty good cut like that. I like to go the other way. So it creates a little bit of a, of a flap. And then there's a good porthole right there. You can see it inside the egg healthy veins. Sometimes I'll give them just a little bit of a poke. And that's why I want to see just a little bit of a cringe like that. I know the animal inside is alive. And again, this may not be the industry standard, but I don't use razor blades. This is what I use and it's what works for me. If it works for you, go for it. If you like razor blades, do your thing. Um, but anyway, it's pretty exciting stuff. So today all the Pataeus mucosas have left their eggs. I incubated these eggs at 81.5 degrees and I like to err on the side of caution and go for the lower temperatures to reduce the possibility of any kind of kinking. And um, they started pipping on day 70 and today's 73. They've all left their eggs. So let's take a look what we got here. So some really handsome looking little babies. Looks like they're all out of the egg. They're all clustered up there on one side. Handsome little guys, really cool. There's one off to the side here. I'm gonna go ahead and use this guy because I'm afraid that all those are gonna explode and erupt out of that tub. 
So here's the little, the little mucosas. And they'll look a little bit different after they shed. The sheds are gonna have a little bit of a yellowish green kind of tint to them. So I'm curious to see what they're gonna look like after they shed. But really cool little guys. I really like these snakes. They're very alert, very smart. Now the adults are all wild caught. You know, as you've seen, they're they're quite defensive. But um, the babies are going to be a whole different story. I mean, they're going to be fast and alert. But, um, you know, they're captive born and bred. So they're going to be a whole different story. So that's really cool. So anyway, all that hard work, you know, you, you hope that it pays off like this. And for me in this situation, it did. So there you go. Patias Macosis.